For the next few, we're going to break down the various branches of the government and how they actually function according to the Constitution and the articles that uh, detail what they can and can't do. And then, of course, how those have uh, changed over time, interpretations of what they can and can't do, and which specific powers they do or don't have. So, um, we'll start with the legislative branch. That's going to be Article 1 of the Constitution. Uh, and in case you forgot from previous lectures or this is your first one, uh, long yard coming on in to listen, uh, that is going to be run by the Congress. So our national legislature, national legislature, uh, that's going to be a Congress, of course, the Congress of the United States. I should probably write it out like that. The Congress of the United States. All right, Congress uh, voted for us. It's a democratic republic, so we, of course, vote for representatives, and those representatives go to Washington, D.C., where our national government's headed, and they're the ones that make uh, laws, because the legislative branch, that's what their role is. Uh, they make laws uh, that uh, encompass the entire United States, uh, except for a few exceptions that are, or limitations that were placed on them by the Constitution itself. So, uh, that's what they are, and again, we're a democratic republic, and the legislative branch, just in case you forgot, uh, that is uh, role equals uh, making laws. All right, so let's go over some of the things they can and can't do. Actually, wait, quick reminder as to what it looks like. Congress is bicameral, meaning there's two different um, entities inside of it that can um, propose and, and, and vote and approve and make laws. So you've got, um, and again, this is kind of a reminder, um, a Senate, here, let me put this first, bicameral. Meaning, of course, it is comprised of two houses. And those two houses are a Senate and the House of representatives. And this is a part of that, uh, well, the, the details of it are part of the Virginia um, uh, plan and the New Jersey plan put forward. Uh, and they, of course, are going to be uh, synthesized uh, in the um, Connecticut Compromise, the Great Compromise. Uh, because again, remember that issue of uh, do we elect representatives based on population or do we have a set amount per state, which of course advan advantages the, the small states on the uh, latter and on the former, the advantage of the big states. Um, Senate is, of course, going to be um, fixed, fixed at uh, two per state, uh, as far as the amount of representatives. And the House of Representatives, of course, are going to be uh, based on population. And that's part of that uh, Connecticut plan or that great compromise. Uh, so that's how they're, they're composed. And um, important to know, with the exception of revenue bills, which we'll, we'll get to when we talk about specific, unique roles of each um, of these two houses, um, either, either House can uh, propose a bill. And the exception to that is a, is a, is a revenue bill, except revenue. That's specific to the House of Representatives. Uh, and in, in both cases, they're going to be um, uh, both houses have to uh, have a majority vote in favor of a law uh, or a bill to make it law. So uh, both have to vote 51% to make law. And then, of course, the president. Uh, makes his or her own markups and sends it back uh, to be reviewed by them, which is essentially a veto, um, that is going to be um, require the two-thirds majority of both houses to, to pass, uh, or two-thirds to override. Yeah, and we'll get to that um, explanation shortly. So that is the general composition, and that, that should be reviewed, hopefully. Uh, so when these... Uh, when we look at what they can do, the, ha the House, Congress as a whole, and then of course each individual House, uh, we look to the actual Constitution for what they can and can't do, as well as uh, prior court cases from the Supreme Court that sort of look at individual issues when it's unclear uh, if what Congress can did or didn't do, if that was constitutional or not. Um, so that's what we look to to see what they can and can't do. So we'll first start with the stuff that Congress as a whole can do, and we'll look at the two individual houses and, and see what they can and can't do and what their qualifications are. So um, if we're looking at exactly what they can and can't do, as it's written in the, in the Constitution, Article 1, um, that those are called expressed or explicit powers because they're just written right in there. Like you can just see them as they are placed. 
So uh, let's go over some of those um, expressed powers. Uh, powers specifically written in the U.S. Constitution. All right. Um, you might also have heard, you may also hear the term delegated powers, like these are given, delegated directly to them, or explicit powers, but we're going to use expressed. Um, however, the other two also work. So expressed powers, uh, ones that they specifically have according to Article One of the Constitution, uh, that's going to be Congress has the power to uh, uh, make laws. And that's, of course, this process here, proposing and uh, voting on law, uh, bills. So they can make laws. Um, they are specifically responsible for um, dealing with taxation and oversight of, of taxation, so collecting revenue. Uh, but for two specific, although broadly and vaguely interpreted, um, um, categories. So they are in charge of uh, uh, revenue uh, raising, so taxes, and oversight of collection for two purposes. For common defense, obviously that's implying the military, uh, and the general welfare. That's the one that's a little less specific and a lot more broad, uh, and that's been um, an issue uh, in the past as far as what Congress can or can't do specifically, uh, which we'll look at a few examples of these uh, as we go through. So you've also got, uh, of course, they're in charge of uh, the impeachment process. And just a reminder, that's a uh, decision to uh, carry out the process, the trial itself. And if they're actually convicted, that doesn't mean they go to jail or anything. They just lose their spot in the government and or uh, can no longer run for public office. They could. They are subject, though, to um, further trials uh, on a criminal or civil uh, case level afterwards. But the impeachment just removes them. All right. So they are able to, they're there for the impeachment process for, for federal officials. And um, some other ones that they have, they're in charge of, and this is another broad one that gets defined, uh, well, broadly, and it's hard to, to pin down exactly what it means. So the Supreme Court's got many cases involving this. Uh, they're in charge of uh, oversight of commerce. So commerce, such an underlying common defense, general welfare, impeachment, making laws. Excuse me, revenue. Um, and also, what am I forgetting? Oh, they are the ones that are going to uh, uh, approve treaties. So treaties with other countries. The uh, president can't do that. The president might be the representative there, the diplomat, or the figurehead, but the treaties themselves are, are going to be ratified and approved by, uh, ratified by uh, uh, Congress, specifically the Senate. We'll go over that in a second, though. Approve treaties. Uh, they are also the ones that declare war. Uh, that's due to the War Powers Clause, which specifically give that to Congress. And I think I'm forgetting any that really matter for this. Um, no, other than that, they're going to be the ones that approve or disapprove of, I should say, appoint. Appoint, executive, and judicial. Actually, no, wait, I'm looking for things that all of Congress can do as a whole. So I shouldn't put that on there. Well, that's specifically the Senate. Uh, that's pretty much what they do as a whole, though. Let me make sure I got that. Yes. So those are uh, shared powers. And I, I realize the revenue raising has to start in the House, which we'll get to, but uh, they're both a part of it, uh, regardless of where it starts. So that's what they do. And again, those are the expressed powers because they're written specifically in there. So in Article 1, there's a bunch of clauses. I can't remember the exact number, but there's a bunch of clauses, which are like little sections that give them these specific powers. Uh, so when you hear a term like the, uh, the uh, Commerce Clause or the War Powers Clause, they're talking about a specific uh, portion of Article I of the Constitution. Um, it depends on what article you're talking about, but that's what you say, Article I, Clause 8, or whatever. Uh, that would mean a specific uh, power that's written in there for them. All right, so here's a couple controversial, changing interpretations of these powers as time has gone on. Some of these are pretty clear. Obviously, making a law impeachment process pretty explicitly stated how those work. There's not a whole lot of controversy as to uh, uh, that particular power. However, in case of making laws, which laws they have authority over uh, and which laws they can and can't pass, uh, like which ones violate rights and which ones overstep their authority uh, as outlined by the Constitution, uh, that becomes the issue. So a couple of things. 
um, one of which is this Commerce Clause, uh, the General Welfare Clause, and then there's a little, been a little bit about this War Powers Clause, too. I just want to briefly go over them. We're going to go too much into it. So the Common Defense uh, issue has been subject to some criticism as far as what they can procure funding for. Uh, most people will agree, obviously, we're going to need a military um, to protect our, our borders at the very least. Uh, most people are pretty um, opposed to any sort of imperialist ambitions, but most people agree we generally have to have one uh, to ensure our own sovereignty and protection from others. So, um, using passing bills, budget bills specifically, uh, money allotted for certain departments of the government, like the Department of Defense, that's normal. So they will uh, collect taxes, so Congress deals with the collecting and levying of taxes. So they bring the money in, and then they're also the ones, they have the oversight, they decide like how that money is distributed. Um, and that's going to be related to uh, these two uh, categories. So common defense. Um, this one is, again, like I said, rather well agreed upon, but there are some issues and some criticisms of that. Mostly, um, so I'll say criticism, criticism, is using these sorts of things corruptly. Now, again, depending on your political alignment or the individual you ask, they're going to have a very different view of this, but there are, regardless, some people, a large amount of people, that uh, are critical of this. And it started going all the way back to uh, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower in the 50s during his resignation speech, farewell speech. Um, he's the one that's going to point this issue out, and it's referred to as the military-industrial complex. So, what this one is, is obviously it makes sense that Congress can make laws that um, raise the revenue through taxes, and then of course they're gonna be the ones that oversee and distribute it to uh, the Defense Department. Uh, the only problem is there is a, at least hypothetical, but probably highly likely, in fact it is highly likely, in fact it's, it does exist to some extent, but the, the, the question of its organization, its impact, is what is under question. Um, there's an interesting relationship between Congress and the Department of Defense, the ones that, of course, have the money for uh, researching uh, and producing, purchasing uh, weapons uh, and training and, and uh, uh, stationing people, members of the military, and private companies that produce uh, and research these things. So you've got Congress, of course. It's kind of like a triangle, iron triangle, some people call it. Um, and they're, of course, going to be the ones that take this revenue and distribute it, and they're going to be giving it to, for defense anyway, uh, the Defense Department. They are ones, so this is going to be tax revenue, so obviously they're the ones collecting it, and they send it to whatever allotment that they have. Uh, some's going to go to these sort of uh, uh, categories, and, and, and some will go to here. They go to the Defense Department. They're the ones that determine how the money is going to be spent in the Defense Department, the defense budget. So that's what pays for the jets and uh, vehicles and weapons, um, aircraft carriers, things like that, for the U.S. military, whether it's, uh, you know, terrestrial army or uh, navy or air force. Uh, they're going to provide for those weapons, but they're also going to provide for uh, research into those things. So this is what invests in uh, certain uh, universities like MIT, for example. Um, so you've got a whole bunch of money being dumped into um, Department of Defense to pay for uh, weapons uh, and also to pay for research uh, for weaponry. And I realize that sounds mm, imperialistic uh, and uh, potentially overly aggressive, etc. Uh, but there are some good things that have come out of this, even if you're, you know, against warfare and violence, which most people are generally. But um, from a lot of these research programs, whether it's uh, state funded through places like MIT and others, uh, or it's contracts to private uh, producers who usually don't do the research because that's, you don't know if it's going to work and you're going to waste a bunch of money, but they do the production uh, and distribution of those researched items. Um, that has actually led to a lot of discoveries and inventions that have helped out regular everyday civilians, like the, uh, I believe the transistor, which is a functional uh, mechanism of like all electronics that we use, uh, was developed there. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the hardware and software for things like the internet and just computing in general uh, were created through this Defense, to fund, uh, Defense Department uh, funding of research at places like MIT and other universities. So it's really benefited civilian life, not just military life. 
but there are some attachments to it that are less uh, beneficial or less clearly um, moral or at least amoralistic and, and might lean towards uh, the immoral. So the Defense Department, of course, they're going to be spending it on, on research, so universities, uh, but they're also going to be uh, purchasing uh, arms production, or purchasing uh, or funding production. And that's going to be uh, where things get more dicey, because here we're talking about um, weapons producers, so manufacturers. And what they're going to be getting from the Defense Department is that uh, those contracts, uh, which of course they're paid for. So tax, revenue, contracts. All right. Uh, and these are the uh, private uh, arms producers, the companies that, that make these things. So uh, the research is done primarily at the universities, state-funded universities. But the production part and distribution is done by private companies. And uh, the issue here, it, I wouldn't even say that the issue is just granting contracts to uh, companies. You, you could obviously point out that there's some room for corruption there um, as far as cronyism goes. Uh, well, there, there's cronyism because... The next step that makes it much more moralistically questionable is going to be um, the process of campaign funding, also known as lobbying in this case, uh, because the criticism here is you have this like self-perpetuating triangle of Congress uh, giving tax revenue to the Defense Department and they are researching and purchasing weapons uh, that are being produced by these companies that make a tremendous amount of money off of these government contracts. And so they use that money to uh, fund the campaigns of Congress people who get voted in and uh, as, a, as a wink to the people that uh, funded their campaigns, they're gonna pass uh, laws and budgets that uh, go into this Defense Department and get cycled back to these companies. Uh, and that's one of the major criticisms here. So some people obviously are uh, concerned with this setup uh, and also they're concerned with the uh, uh, violence and destruction it potentially perpetuates, whether it's giving us better weapons or us selling them to uh, other regimes with, that have used them destructively, uh, like the regimes in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, for the most part, obtained a lot of their uh, weapons from uh, U.S. producers. Uh, but anyways, but there's also the, the benefits too. It's, it's uh, generated a lot of research that, while militaristically oriented, has given us a lot, a lot of uh, uh, civilian benefits. Nonetheless, that's one of the issues of the common defense, um, as far as criticisms go. All right, uh, general welfare. This one is also one that's open for interpretation because that one's really vague as far as what do they mean by general welfare? Uh, what, what constitutes or details the general welfare of people? Their health, their safety, like uh, their education? Like how is that applied? And that's what's made it so controversial over the years uh, because, and the Supreme Court has gone different ways on this, uh, but this deals with things like is Social Security uh, constitutional, which of course has been ruled that it is, um, because previously that would have been uh, shot down by the Supreme Court. Uh, but following the 1930s and the Great Depression um, and FDR and, the, and their, their movements for the New Deal, uh, we've had a lot of decisions that have gone in favor of uh, very broad interpretations. Another one is the Great Society legislation uh, by um, Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s. Uh, that added like Medicare, you know, Medicaid, made food stamp access easier, things like that. Um, that before, certainly the 1930s and 1960s would have been shot down uh, by members of Congress at the Supreme Court. Uh, our interpretation now sort of includes those things like health and then like I mentioned too, education, uh, uh, disability and aid and, and, and pensions, protections for workers. They've included those as general welfare uh, interpretations. So this could mean uh, social programs, whether it's the New Deal stuff from the 30s, uh, or it is the um, uh, Great Society from the 60s, and there's a whole bunch of other examples too. These are just some major examples uh, in history as far as how to interpret those powers and how to apply them. Uh, and then what was the other one I was gonna talk about? Oh, two more, uh, commerce and declare war. Uh, another one that's been controversial or unclear was commerce, like what does that mean exactly? What industries does it apply to and how? That one's also dependent on Supreme Court interpretations of the time. So over time, that one's also changed. When it first started out, like the first few decades of our Republic and the Supreme Court and the judicial branch, according to Article 3, uh, with uh, John Marshall as the Chief Justice anyway, they had a very uh, broad interpretation of, of Congress's application of this Commerce Clause. Commerce, again, just means like business, engaging in business. 
uh, particularly across state and foreign uh, uh, boundaries. So, as far as Congress's powers go, uh, you've had a couple different interpretations. You had, um, in the uh, early 19th century, it was very uh, broad or indirect. So one example is uh, the case of uh, Gibbons versus Ogden. You're like, I've never heard of that. What are you talking about? Uh, in 1824, if you're an A push or AP Gov, you'll know this one. Um, just to briefly tell you guys, it's just an example of the Supreme Court interpreting the clause in the favor of the national government, of Congress rather than the states. Because the issue was Gibbons, I read the exact details, he wanted to, he reserved a federal certificate to operate his steamboat company on the Hudson River in New York. But the issue was Ogden had a uh, specific uh, monopoly right granted by the state of New York. Um, however, the Hudson River, of course, is connected to or borders with other states uh, and is connected to the ocean itself. So they actually ruled in favor of Gibbons, saying that um, even transportation for commerce counts. So it's very indirect um, uh, ruling in this case. However, um, for the rest of the 19th century uh, till about the 1930s, uh, it was a very uh, direct direct interpretation. So they tended to favor uh, state and local uh, rulings as opposed to federal government rulings, but then it's going to uh, seesaw back in the 1930s all the way until about the 1990s, start with the New Deal. They um, are going to swap back towards this very indirect interpretation, meaning they favored a lot of the stuff uh, for the national government. So all these powers that and acts that Congress passed the issue was, is that actually linked to commerce or not? Uh, the, the courts tended to favor Congress, uh, even if uh, a lot of people didn't think so. Uh, in the 90s, though, it gets a bit more mixed. So the 1990s and onward, uh, I think 1995 was the first one where this, this it ruled in favor of, uh, uh, or ruled against the national government. That was, I think it was the U.S. versus Lopez, where they uh, decided that... Um, that was, I think that in, in the state or district he was in, they banned the carrying of firearms, which is the Second Amendment uh, uh, right, uh, but there weren't really that 2008, 2010 uh, cases to really uh, solidify that or codify that. However, they did shoot this one down, this rule down, because Congress passed it and they said that carrying a firearm has no uh, impact on actual commerce, so they shot that one down. Uh, but they've also upheld other ones too that would seem to possibly contradict this, like the, the marijuana uh, issue, about how uh, they con Congress can regulate or ban uh, drugs such as marijuana because there is interstate competition uh, regarding marijuana itself. So uh, they've had some mixes since the 90s, but that's kind of the general history of how it's been interpreted. And the last thing uh, is this declaring war issue with the War Powers Clause. Uh, while Congress does uniquely have the ability to declare war or not. It's only been declared a few times. I might have this incorrect, but I think the only times they declared war was War of 1812, Mexican-American War, was Spanish-American War, World War War I and World War II. I think all the times we've been at war and we've been in plenty of wars, uh, it wasn't a formal declaration. They gave temporary power authority to the president to carry out military action. Uh, so there have been in some instances, some instances of presidential uh, war capacity. They did that, for example, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution in Vietnam, where they gave uh, Lyndon Johnson the uh, authority to, to uh, intervene militaristically uh, without a formal declaration of war against North Vietnam. Uh, so that's an example of that. Uh, other examples include like the Persian Gulf War, I think was similar. I don't think we declared war on that one either. I think that one was a, a presidential authority um, uh, uh, vote or permission. But yeah, those are essentially the expressed powers and how some of them have, uh, have been interpreted differently over time. Uh, and there is some controversy, depending on your political affi affiliation, whether you support particular interpretations or not. We'll get more into that, though, when we get to the Supreme Court part. But that's the expressed powers. And the reason why I mention that is if I put a, I'm going to leave this down here so we can see it. Um, there are also what we call implied powers. So expressed means, I've, I've said it specifically, they have this power or they don't have this power. Implied means it's not written, but 
in order to carry these out, you have to be able to do this. So an implied power is one that's not written in the Constitution, so you won't find in Article 1 uh, in any of the clauses. But in order for them to actually do these things, uh, they have to be able to use some of these implied powers. So here's a couple examples. Uh, implied powers. So uh, for implied powers, if I'm going to, uh, for example, collect revenue or oversee it, I need institutions to do that. So an example of an implied power would be the formation of a national bank, uh, or uh, after 1911 anyway, or 13, 13, uh, slash the Federal Reserve. This is the monetary, uh, monetary uh, authority that um, holds our currency in reserve. Uh, and either adds it uh, or, or retracts it uh, with, with certain incentives and disincentives. Uh, so that one is not, there's nowhere in the Constitution that says they can do that. And that was a big issue, especially uh, during the early 19th century. Um, but nonetheless, these uh, were considered legal because the Congress has the authority to do that in order to uh, help regulate commerce and um, also uh, um, raise and oversee revenue. Form uh, budget committees. So forming committees that would, of course, go ahead and uh, propose laws and and and, and uh, edit them, and, and and then later, of course, forming committees that actually supervise uh, and uh, regulate those institutions they form, uh, like for example, perhaps uh, the IRS and things like that. Uh, those are things that are that can be overseen by committees uh, as appointed by Congress. So budget committees. Uh, are an implied power. Other examples might be things like uh, laws uh, about health care. The Affordable Health Care Act, also known as Obama, Obamacare, uh, that was uh, considered constitutional because that is applying the broad interpretation of the general welfare having to do with that. Uh, so those are some implied powers that help them carry those things out. Uh, the last type of power we're going to talk about, just, just so we kind of have an idea of what these terms mean we talk about um, the government. Uh, one we already know, actually, reserved powers. Those are reserved just for the states. We have that from our previous uh, lectures. So powers reserved for the states, this is the, of course, um, uh, Amendment 10, 10th Amendment, the one that grants um, all powers to the states uh, that are not mentioned uh, in the um, Constitution. So all not expressed to the states. We already know that one. Uh, some examples of that are, there's nothing in the Constitution about education uh, or marriage laws. Uh, what other examples did we give? Um, uh, things like the drinking age. Uh, business regulations inside the states for businesses solely in states that don't uh, go between states or compete with other states. Uh, those are examples. Uh, and the last one I want to talk about is what's called concurrent powers. Uh, those ones are held by both the state and the federal. And of course, if they ever conflict, uh, you're, unless they're being unconstitutional, you're going to defer to the national governments. Uh, but these are powers held by both state and national uh, government. So some examples of those are going to be like uh, states can also... Uh, levy taxes. Um, what are some other ones? Uh, states also, they can um, create their own law, bills and laws. So those are some a couple of examples of concurrent powers. Uh, and again, keep in mind, if any of these conflict with, well, first of all, the Constitution, they'll be shot down. But if they conflict with the uh, national government, uh, they have to defer to that national government. So that's an important thing to know as far as uh, what these powers mean, because there's, there's four terms. So again, express means it's written directly in the Constitution uh, for the national government. Implied means not written in there, but they have the authority to do these things in order to carry them out. Again, examples are if they're in charge of commerce uh, and revenue raising, they can form the National Bank, Federal Reserve, committees to oversee things uh, for tax collection and, and distribution, um, health care for the general welfare, things like that. Reserve powers are just for the states because they're not given to the, the national government. That's the 10th Amendment. And the concurrent are ones that they uh, have together, like we mentioned, levying taxes uh, and bills and laws. Important to note, the state 
obviously uh, laws and levying of taxes only apply to the state uh, within its own boundaries. California laws don't apply to Nevada. Yeah, obviously that one makes sense. Uh, but yeah, those are the uh, four powers um, that we might talk about regarding uh, various roles within uh, the government in the United States as far as the um, uh, local, uh, state, and um, national governments go. All right, so now let's look at the qualifications. And actually, wait, no, hold on. I want to go for limitations first because there are some things Congress specifically can't do uh, that are in Article 1. So uh, specific limitations. This isn't all of them, but it's just a couple of them. All right, no, I should say for Congress. So uh, one example is if you're a member of Congress, you can't hold any offices in the government outside of, of, of that, of, of Congress, uh, because they don't want any sort of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, they want separation of powers to be maintained. They want you to have any interests in any other parts of the government, whether it's the executive branch uh, or the judicial branch or in a state government, you can't hold any other offices. So no concurrent uh, state or federal uh, positions held during uh, Congress um, tenure term, congressional term. So if I'm elected House of Representatives, um, I, and I was a state, I don't know, legislature member or, or a governor or whatever it would be, or a member of the cabinet for the president, I have to resign that um, in order to uh, actually fulfill my seat. Or if I'm already a member of Congress or, Senate, or uh, House or the Senate, then I can't take on any other um, role. I could later or before, but I can't hold them concurrently at the same time. Um, other limitations they have, uh, let's see here. They can't, um, so there's no bills of attainer. That is illegal, and that is to maintain habeas corpus. Bill of attainer just means uh, that would be Congress passing a law saying you're guilty of something without a trial and then punishing you for it. That is illegal, obviously. We are guaranteed our right to a trial and due process uh, by a jury. Uh, and in fact, to be indicted, you need a grand jury to even uh, pursue those charges, and then, then a jury appears to determine your uh, guilt or innocence, reach a verdict. Um, you can also, uh, they can't uh, know what are called no ex post facto laws. So they can't pass laws that punish you for things before they were illegal. So let's say, uh, I'm gonna make one up. I'm sure there's real examples, I can't think of any. Let's say for some reason, before 1970, there was no law that said, um, oh, here's one. In fact, I think there isn't one right now. The Supreme Court had an in interesting ruling on this one. Um, I actually can't remember if they were in favor or against, but cannibalism in the United States, technically not illegal. Uh, so it would definitely be legal if you killed and, and ate somebody. Uh, but so far as I know, and the issue was uh, they found on the internet uh, a forum where somebody wanted to be eaten and somebody wanted to eat somebody, so they consensually agreed to carry that out. And the issue was, do we convict the guy of murder or not? Um, I can't remember how that ruling actually ruled out. I can't believe I forgot it. Uh, nonetheless, let's say the Supreme Court found him not guilty because it was two consensual adults and they have records of this, this consent and it being carried out, uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, pass a law later banning it and then punish him for what he did before the law went into effect. So if they make a law go into effect January 20th, or January 1st of 2020, for example, this, the current year here, um, if you committed that crime before January 1st, 2020, you can't be uh, held accountable for that or, or indicted for that. So that's what no ex post facto laws only can be tried for laws that were actually uh, in effect during the time of the uh, alleged crime. All right, and then they can also uh, uh, no titles, uh, nobility handled out. So nobility doesn't exist here, so you can't, of course, declare somebody uh, lord or earl or duke of an area and give them these uh, um, exclusive exclusionary powers uh, or lands can't be done. Uh, it's made illegal. Uh, that's something we don't worry about today, but nowadays, but in the 18th century when they wrote this up, it was, it was a much bigger uh, issue. Okay, so there's the limitations. Now let's quickly go over the qualifications and unique powers of the Senate and the House of Representatives, uh, the two houses of the Congress. So you've got the House of Representatives, that 
That's one. And we've got the Senate. All right. Um, so term length, and I realize I've talked about some of these when we talked about the, uh, you know, uh, Virginia plan and New Jersey plan and the Connecticut uh, plan and the comp Great Compromise, but uh, this is more specific, particularly for people tuning in, this is their first one. So House of Representatives, uh, like I mentioned before, it's gonna be population-based. And the idea here was uh, they wanted this house to be one that was the closest to the people. People meaning regular folks that are not part of the government. Um, if you're elected successfully, then you will uh, serve a two-year term and after that point, uh, you're going to have to uh, run again. So you have to recamp. You're going to campaign again and hope that your constituents, the people in your district, uh, vote you back in again. Uh, and this, this, this happens and changes uh, over time. Um, I should mention, too, every 10 years. Yeah, I'll just mention it here. Um, the, uh, the amount of seats per state changes. Uh, so obviously, it's fixed at, I should mention that, too, by the way. To your term, and how many members there are, is it? It's fixed at 435, uh, and that's of, as of 1920. I think it's called the re reapportionment law. That might not be the name of it. I'll just put 1929. I think it's the reapportionment act. Um, but nonetheless, 1929 when they uh, fixed the number at 435. So that means that there's 435 seats in the House of Representatives. And they have to change every 10 years with the census how many each state have based on their population. Let's say, for example, like California has the most, for example. Let's say half the people just left California for whatever reason. Uh, so this latest census would indicate, oh, half your population left. We would lose roughly here in California half of our House of Representative seats. And those, those extra 25 or so seats would go be distributed to other states based on where that population lives. So let's say hypothetically, half the people from California uh, moved across the border of Nevada. Uh, we would, in California, lose 25 or so seats, and uh, Nevada would gain them uh, based on this 435 uh, seats. And that's gonna be um, the, uh, every 10 years you have a census. I should say census every 10 years. And that's just to get population demographics. Demographics mean um, in an area what the, the people are like as far as their age and gender, maybe religion, other things. Demographics mean anything. But in particular here, we want to see how many people live in which areas, right? They, they don't care as much. They will ask for your, your, your race and things like that just to get some information. But more, the, the important part is they want to know how many people are in each state and in each area. So that way they can um, reapportion or change the amount of representatives in a state if necessary. Um, so since it's every uh, 10 years um, to reportion house reps. So again, that's the example I, I gave. If California lost half the people uh, from one census to another, um, once they got that information, though half the seats from California would be given to another state um, or however many states it would go. But if half people went to Nevada, they would just get those um, those seats in the uh, House of Representatives, House, half of them or so. All right, so census every 10 years to reapportion the House reps. Okay, but if I'm actually going to run for the House of Representatives to be a, be a member, there are some uh, minimum qualifications. So let's go over those real quick. Qualifications. By the way, we're going to go over this process here um, of um, how the reapportionment process works. Uh, in the next lecture. Um, so that's qualifications. I'm actually going to save that because we'll catch up on the Senate and we'll, we'll kind of do them together. All right, Senate, hopping over for a second. Uh, this one is uh, to her state, uh, regardless of population. I actually forgot to mention, this is population-based, but every state gets at least one representative. Uh, I accidentally even mentioned that up there. Uh, two per state. This one's supposed to be the more prestigious um, House, right? They want it's it's 100 members, right? Since we got 50, so at this point it's 100 members, 100 reps, and here we got 435 reps. So Congress as a whole's got 535 plus the vice president who's going to cast the uh, tie-breaking vote if there's a tie in the Senate. Um, you have two per state, and um, it's supposed to be more prestigious. So it initially was the state legislatures uh, elect. 
senators. But that's going to change um, with the 17th Amendment during the Progressive Era. That was an era where people got sick of uh, big business, essentially, uh, cartels and trusts, just pretty much corruptly bribing or lobbying to state legislatures uh, to get certain representatives sent to the Senate. And it, of course, would pass laws that favored you know, whatever major company uh, or, or, or conglomerate there was, uh, whether it was like you know, the Rockefellers, the Carnegie's, or whoever it would be. Um, state legislature elected them. Uh, but the uh, 17th Amendment, but now uh, it's a direct election by uh, state citizens, our state residents. And the one that did that, changed that, was the 17th Amendment. So that's what it is right now. Right now there's no state legislatures that vote for a senator. Um, rather, uh, somebody is um, in charge of, I'm sorry, not somebody, Rather, uh, we, as a, the people of state, vote like a direct popular vote for, for our senators. Okay, so that's um, how we elect them. Uh, we've got 100 uh, per. What was I going to talk about now? I forgot. Oh, in both cases, I'm going to erase this for a second. If a senator or a house rep, I don't know, they're impeached and removed, or they die, or they resign, whatever it might be, there are procedures for um, replacing them. Um, basically, you get a special election uh, called by the governor um, and then conducted or called by the, through the state legislature uh, that are going to uh, have a specific election for that. I think it's the Senate. I think it's the Senate, not the House. I think it's the Senate where the uh, governor can technically pick a temporary replacement. Uh, but um, in both cases, I believe you have to vote it in. It's pretty rare that happens anyway, uh, but that's the process. All right, cool. So... I don't know why I raced it because I'm going to go over it because I think I covered all the things I wanted to. Yeah. Okay. Now qualifications if you actually want to run for office in the Senate or the House. And they're a little bit different. They're very similar, but they're, they're a little different. Uh, what's different is the numbers, but the criteria are, are pretty much the same. So there are age minimums uh, for the House. It's less prestigious. Uh, 25 years old is the minimum. That must be. Uh, for the Senate, you've got to be at least 30 years old. Those are the minimum ages. Uh, and those were older in the 18th century. Nowadays, it's almost, I don't want to say it's guaranteed, but it's not common for people not to reach these ages. Back then, it, it was a lot less common than it is now to reach, you know, uh, your mid-20s or, or your 30s. So those are the qualifications um, as far as age goes. Then you've also got, um, they must be a... And for, for, the, for the House of Representatives, that be, just means they have to res, uh, live there and have a tent of the state. That doesn't mean, though, that they have to like own property there. That would be a resident. For the Senate, you do. Uh, it's really rare that an inhabitant gets voted that doesn't actually live there or own property there. It's happened a couple times. But for the Senate, uh, you have to be a, a resident of the state. And again, this means I own property. This is my official residence. Uh, this means I'm just, I happen to be living there or staying there um, but without a permanent residence. Okay. Um, other qualifications are, oh, you have to have been a uh, citizen of the United States for at least seven years. And since this is a bit more prestigious, uh, you have to be a uh, citizen of the United States of the U.S. for uh, at least nine years. Those are the uh, differences in qualification. Uh, for them. Um, just a note uh, to sort of, I guess, talk about who runs these things. Actually, no, we'll go to the, to the unique features of it. Uh, I think I can fit them in the bottom here, even if it ends up being awkward. Uh, unique features about each one, like unique powers that they have, uh, or, or members. Unique qualities, or characteristics, or powers. There we go. Now, characteristics. Characteristics. So uh, here are the differences between the two, uh, besides you know these qualifications and, and, and whatnot. Um, the House can do two things that the Senate cannot. Number one, they're the only ones that can initiate an impeachment uh, proceeding. Uh, the Senate's the one that actually carries out the uh, impeachment uh, trial. So uh, these this uh, group can uniquely impeach process. Initiation. So even if the Senate really wants to impeach somebody, they can't actually start the process. 
Uh, likewise, even if the House really wants to impeach somebody and remove them, they can't do it. Uh, after voting to, by a majority vote, to uh, initiate the process uh, and, and begin the trial, the Senate's the one that carries out the actual trial. So uh, they can actually have the impeachment trial. And the impeachment trial, when it reaches this phase, uh, this is where the Senate is the one that uh, does the hearing and voting, uh, determines the verdict. Uh, but it's going to be presided over or, or run or managed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court because they don't want any uh, conflict of interest there to sort of, uh, you know, run through the proceedings and the procedures of the trial. Um, but again, don't forget impeachment means, well, first of all, initiating it is deciding to have the trial. That's the House by majority. Uh, and it's going to require a two-thirds vote for the Senate to actually uh, convict somebody, find them guilty of whatever the, the alleged crime is. Uh, and impeachment, again, I said this before, that means they're removed from office and more than likely also banned from future public office. Any criminal charges or civil charges are going to be, are going to take place outside of the impeachment process. This simply removes and or bans um, members from public office. Okay, the House, one of the other uh, unique features they have is they have what's called or referred to as the power of purse, which means they're the only ones that can uh, initiate taxes on, um, or sorry, bills on revenue uh, collection or oversight. Uh, the Senate is going to have to also uh, view and approve it and, and pass it just as um, uh, the House does, because for a bill to be passed, both Houses have to vote on it, like I mentioned before. But uh, uniquely, the House closest to the people, at least as it was originally designed, uh, was the one that can initiate uh, bills on taxing and spending. So power of purse has to start here, uh, originators. And that's, of course, going to be taxing and spending. Okay. Um, and the Senate's got a few more, though. The Senate is the one that can uh, ratify treaties. So um, if there is a treaty with another nation um, about a war issue or, or whatever it might be, uh, the Senate's the one that actually is going to uh, view and, and ratify those treaties. The House is not involved in that. Uh, and the last one I want to talk about here is the appointment of uh, executive and judicial uh, positions. So they're the ones that uh, approve presidential selections to the Supreme Court, and I think also the federal judges. Uh, and they also uh, um, are going to approve the presidential advisors, the, the cabinet, as it's known now. Uh, they're the ones that are going to uh, approve those, uh, appoint them, essentially. So the uh, submissions are, are, the selections are submitted by the president, um, particularly for the Supreme Court and the cabinet positions, uh, or ambassador positions, diplomats, and that um, they'll be approved by, uh, or appointed by, the Senate. And that's the, the major difference in actual powers. Other than that, though, uh, they're going to be shared. The only differences are, like, the qualifications and um, uh, the, the term length for each one. And, of course, the, the number in each. Uh, but those are the unique characteristics that they have. Um, and then lastly, I want to talk about real quick the kind of leaders, the people who are presiding over the Senate and the House and uh, de you know, decide who speaks and, and, and all that. Uh, the head of the House of Representatives is known as the Speaker of the House. That's a position that's voted for by the House. Uh, nowadays, it's just the leader of the majority party. So uh, at the, 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 the time of this filming, it's uh, Nancy Pelosi. And uh, she's the Speaker of the House. That's actually third in line of the President, by the way. The President dies or assassinated, and then it goes to the Vice President, then next up is the uh, Speaker of the House. Uh, and that's gonna be the uh, uh, majority party leader. Uh, and they have some uh, discretion as far as uh, on hearings, who can speak and, and all of that. Uh, they have quite a, they wield a bit of authority, about as much as you can, uh, and they are voted for. We'll talk specifically about that, though, when we talk about the bill passing and then the, the compositions and, uh, of, of, of like the, the parties and how they play things out in Congress with like majority leaders and minority leaders and whips and things like that. All right, and then uh, technically the ones that are supposed to preside over the um, Senate, it's different. Uh, they need a tie-breaking vote because there's 100 members, obviously, that can be even. Uh, so technically, the one that's supposed to preside and cast a tie-breaking vote are the vice president, uh, the other tie-breaker. But they're hardly ever there to actually um, uh, preside over it. It's not common. Uh, 
when the president's not there, they're supposed to be the person presiding, it's supposed to be what's called the president, uh, de tempore, and that's supposed to be the most senior member of the uh, majority party, uh, but they can also have uh, majority party leaders uh, um, preside over the Senate. Uh, the Senate has a bit different, has some different rules. Uh, for example, there are limits on time on how much you can speak in the House of Representatives, mostly because there's so many members. Um, but there are no limits on how long you can speak in the Senate. So you could potentially go up there and talk as long as you can uh, to try to stall uh, a vote or something like that. We'll talk about that uh, later, probably, on the next one. That's called a filibuster. Um, but there are some, some requirements there, too. Uh, regardless, that is basically the, uh, a good overview of the legislative branch uh, and their powers, and then the qualifications and unique features of the House and the Senate. Um, and then next, we're going to talk about the dynamics of passing a bill and the, the party makeup and how these leaders and such are determined, and then what uh, legislation looks like on a, on a state or a local level, at least briefly. Thank you.